at uh, software engineering processes, methods and methodologies which allow you to build software systems in a very streamlined manner. Uh, but most of these have focused on the building of fairly large software systems in which there is a significant amount of design to be done, there is a significant require, body of requirements that has been established, a specification has been written and so on. And there is a typical process that you end up following to deliver systems of that kind. But there may also be situations in which businesses need the turnaround time of software development to be very, very small. In other words, they need the product of the requirement that they end up specifying very, very quickly because they are responding to a certain business need in turn. Um, and this necessitates a different model to be followed in the production of software and that is what agile development is all about. Uh, it is about trying to turn around requirements very, very quickly maybe in an incremental mode, in fact most often in incremental mode so that there is some output at the end of a very short period and the rest of the output can follow behind that. And we will take a look today at some of the processes and the methodologies that we can um, use to uh, turn software around very, very fast. So the objectives of this part of this course uh, is to basically explain how an iterative incremental process is very, very useful to uh, to, to deliver software quickly and what are the, uh, what are the uh, aspects of such a process, you know, what, what are the considerations to be followed in such a process. Um, to explain the principles of a particular programming methodology called extreme programming and we will go into a little bit of detail about extreme programming which is one of the latest and one of the newest practices in software development and to explain the roles of what is called prototyping in the software development process. So why is software develop, rapid software development required? I mean why is there a need to turn something around very, very quickly? Uh, whereas traditionally software was constructed the way that other things are constructed. So for example if, example, if you are building a dam or if you are building a bridge across a river, there is no shortcut method to be followed. You know the bridge or the dam has to be designed, measurements have to be taken, uh, the design has to be very carefully validated to make sure that it is going to withstand the weight, the speeds of the vehicles that are moving over it and so on uh, before construction is begun. And there is no piecemeal construction of the structure, either the structure is there and usable or it is not at all, right. It is just a binary uh, kind of a decision there. But in the case of software, it need not be the case by the very nature of the name, right, because there can be very rapidly changing business conditions that lead the business to uh, make certain decisions. So they have to respond. So maybe there is a new opportunity around the corner that they have to respond to. Maybe it is a new service that they wish to introduce in say the, the telecommunications domain. Or there may be competitors who are coming up with certain products that the business has to respond to in which case it may have to make changes to its own products, right. So all of this requires a software development which where the delivery is very, very critical. Right? and the delivery has to happen very quickly um, and so that requirement comes about uh, and it is obviously often true that there has to be some compromise that is going to be made between uh, the time that it takes to deliver a product and the quality of the product at the end of the day. As long as there is some software available uh, to be rolled out <coughs> that, shows that, uh, that shows that progress has been made and the rest of it can come. Uh, come along in a sequential manner, uh, then it is okay. So there, there may be businesses that, that accept a slightly lower standard of quality uh, in a shorter time cycle and uh, quality can be improved as things go along. So maybe non-functional requirements may not be perfect, uh, it may not be able to carry the same amount of load for example, the software. Uh, but as time goes along, we can improve the performance, we can improve the reliability, we can improve the availability of the software as well. So it, because of the, the changing nature of uh, the environment and because of the, the rapid changes that are taking place in the business environment, it may not be possible always to arrive at a system requirements phase which can be called complete uh, in any sense of the term before you, you move on to system specification, before you move on to functional specifications, design, development and testing and so on. So if the requirements themselves keep on changing. And therefore, the traditional uh, waterfall models of development that we have seen so far uh, is not very easy to follow that, right? Because there, there is a presumption that the requirements phase is complete 
before you move on to the design phase or the specification phase of the software and that may not be possible here because requirements are coming in incrementally. So uh, the details of the new service may not all be known, a new service is going to be introduced and here are the essential characteristics of the service. Um, uh, but the details of the characteristics may not be known and that may come in as the project progresses and therefore iterative uh, delivery of software is the only way to handle changing requirements like this. So what are the characteristics and what are the, what are the fundamental or the essential nature of an agile process of development? Agile process basically refers to delivering software quickly, right? Um, so the, the one of the characteristics is that uh, we just notice that the requirements phase cannot be complete before we move on to the other phases, which means implicitly that these phases are concurrent in nature. So the, the requirement specification phase, the design phase, the development phase and the test phase often may be concurrent with one another. So there is also there is no detailed specification typically written out for this. The design documentation can be very minimal because you are moving very, very quickly in order to get the software out. Right. So what the characteristics are that uh, because of the incomplete nature of the requirements, because of the changing requirements and because of the concurrency of the different phases, uh, the system is usually delivered in increments. It is delivered in very, very small increments and every increment is complete in of itself has to be integrated back into the main system as the project progresses. And another very key feature is that because it is delivered in increments and that is the key word here. Uh, the users get to see, sample and you know touch and feel the software very early on in the life cycle um, so that they can give feedback, they can give suggestions for improvement of the existing software, they can also tune the further requirements that they are going to give in a way that is going to make it easier for you to construct the rest of the software, right? that is one thing. The, the third and the last characteristic here is that user interfaces are typically developed very early on here to get user feedback and they can be developed using a uh, interactive paradigm. So for example, there could be something which will allow you to change the positions of the buttons, which will allow you to change the positions of the forms, the text fields that you would have to enter, the kinds of inputs that you would have to give and all of these can in fact be changed on the fly as the user is experiencing uh, using the software and these changes can be made permanent going forward. So an agile process is really focusing on what is called a rapid ap application development environment um, and the things that go along with that. So what is an iterative uh, development process? Let us take a look at what the process itself looks like. Uh, we have drawn out a diagram here where you start out by defining the different system variables that can exist. Now once the architecture, the system variables lead to a decision on what kind of architecture is to be employed. So for example, a pipes and filter architecture can be employed, a three tier architecture can be employed, a rule based architecture can be employed and so on. Uh, once the architecture decision is made, then the, the requirement that exists up till this point in time is specified in a series of increments. So for, for that increment that you are going to take up development on, you specify what it is going to contain uh, and once that increment has been specified you go ahead and build the increment right just like you would do in a normal software development process. Now what happens typically is once you finish development of the software you test it so that step is exactly the same except that you are doing it for a very limited subsection of the requirements which is, uh, which is what exists within the increment and once the test and the validation phase is complete. The phase that exists here which is quite important and which is happening very often is an integration phase that, that, that may exist only once during the life cycle of a typical software development process which is non-agile in nature. Um, uh, many of these can exist because this entire thing all the way from specifying the increment all the way to testing the system can be a loop because you specify many increments, right? Uh, so once the integration phase is done we then have to test the entire system. What we tested back here in, in the, the increment testing phase is you are testing the code that was written during this particular increment, you are testing the features that were supposed to be built during this increment but then once you integrate with the rest of the software that exists you have to test the system as a whole and once the system as a whole is tested then there is a question to be asked. Now is the system complete or is a new increment to be specified? If the system is complete 
then you move out of here to delivery of the system. If the system is not complete, then you go back to specifying the next increment within the process. So, the, an iterative process is basically very similar to the spiral model of development that you have seen earlier during life cycle models. And um, even there, the, the focus is on trying to um, iterate over small amounts of requirements and go through the complete software development life cycle with that small set of requirements, come back, get user feedback and then start work on the uh, additional uh, set of requirements, requirements that may exist. And the iterative process is very, very similar uh, except that the frequency with which this cycle uh, occurs or repeats will be quite high compared to the spiral development model. So, yeah, there are many more increments. In, in fact, an increment could be something as small as a single uh, single small set of requirements which is called a story which we will see as we go down the rest of this uh, presentation. So, what what is it that is so good about the iterative development process is something that we would like to look at next. What are the advantages of such a process and what are the disadvantages of such a process? Uh, the obvious advantage is that there is an accelerated del, you know, del, del, delivery to the customer. So, the customer is going to get something in their hands pretty quickly. It may not be the whole system, but it is something that they can use to give feedback to the software development team um, and they can also see for themselves if this is the system that they want developed. Is it progressing in a way that they believe is right for their needs? So, every uh, increment essentially delivers the, the feature set that is the highest priority to the customer, right. So, the customer evaluates that and gives immediate feedback and that itself is another advantage. The user is always engaged with the system. So, it is not possible for example, in this process for you to go off into a corner, do development of a large system completely, then come back to the user um, and then the user figures out oops, this is not what I wanted at all. This, uh, this is entirely wrong. I think I will have to restart specifying the system. Uh, that cannot happen with this process because they are going to see something very quickly. <clears throat> in fact, they are not just going to see sketches of user interfaces, but they will see an entire system which they can actually uh, work, which they can actually experience, which they can play with and then give feedback to the users. I mean uh, feedback back to the software development team. Um, so, uh, the, the, the users are very committed in this entire process and that is a very, very big advantage of the process. Um, also, uh, it is very likely that as the user sees uh, this the system as it is being delivered to them, they might change the requirements so that uh, the, the eventually the end product that is delivered to the customer exactly meets the needs that they do have. On the other hand, the, the system also presents certain disadvantages, right. Uh, uh, disadvantages are there can be serious management problems with this uh, process. Uh, progress can be very, very hard to judge because of the levels of increments. So, suppose there are uh, a medium sized system has 20 to 25 increments that have to be done. Sometimes increments are as short as 1 to 2 weeks in nature. Uh, so, a system that originally took maybe a year or 2 years to build would have like close to 100 increments. And to keep track of all these increments and whether progress is being eventually being made towards the overall goal of delivering the software product to the customer is a hard thing to do because the customer is allowed to change requirements on a per increment basis, right. That is one thing. Also the focus is not on documentation and as long as there are no design documents, it may be, it may start getting hard to judge exactly what has been done up to date and what is the amount of work that is remaining to be done. Uh, there can be contractual problems that lead out of this process, uh, the same thing and different forms of contracts may have to be used because a typical contract would say here is a specification of a system to be built and this is what it is going to cost in terms of time and money to build this, the number of people that are going to be used, the resources that are going to be required and so on. But that process is not as clean in the case of agile development. Here it says you know for, for one increment it is pretty clear what you are going to do. It is a set of well specified requirements as far as one increment is concerned, but you it is hard to keep signing contracts on a per increment basis. The contract has to be for the for the period of development of the entire software uh, project and it is hard to do that here. Uh, again validation problems can also exist uh, since there is no real specification, the specification keeps changing. There is no single body of specification against which validation can be done. 
uh, as a result of which validating whether you are on the right track can be a little hard. This is mainly done informally because of user feedback and that, that is actually a plus that works very well. Uh, but, but there is no formal method of validation verification that can be applied in this process. And certainly the complexity of the software tends to grow over a period of time because of all the changes that are being made to it constantly. Uh, it's a, uh, during every iteration you may end up adding to the code, you may end up modifying existing code because of the additional requirement that you are taking and so on. As a result of which designs may not be very clean and the complexity of the software may grow to a point where, uh, where maintainability becomes a real issue and uh, that is something that we will have to watch out for in this case. Now uh, very similar to the lines of what is called iterative development is another process called prototyping, software prototyping and you have probably heard of this during uh, uh, the earlier version of this course um, and prototyping is while very similar to incremental development does not really focus on delivery to a customer. Uh, what it essentially is, is a technique for the software development team uh, to satisfy themselves that they have made some progress in the right direction here. It can also be used to get feedback from a user, but it is a prototype is not an entity that is eventually going to be given to the user for them to keep. Also a prototype could be something that is purely a, a front end sketch of the system. For example, it, it may just contain dummy user interfaces that do not actually uh, end up doing anything in terms of business logic for example may not be coded in the case of a prototype. Um, so for from very large systems iterative development can prove, uh, uh, can prove a hindrance as we have seen because of some of the disadvantages uh, and because the impracticality of using iterative development we might need to resort to some other means and prototyping is the best way of doing that. So uh, the prototyping is, a, is, is basically a process where uh, experimental systems are developed, they may or may not be used, typically prototypes are thrown away before uh, real system development starts and they may be used just to validate certain proof of concept, certain design ideas that are going to be used in the eventual software. So a prototype is just an initial version of a system uh, by definition and it is used to demonstrate concepts as we just said. Um, and it can be used in, in several uh, different situations. It can be used for example in the requirements engineering process uh, to help out with the requirement solicitation. So uh, what, what it does here is that the user is trying to specify let us say a user interface need that he has, the system is uh, needs to give me a form to enter some data, let us say it is a banking system or a financial system and it needs to give me a form to enter some data. I do not know what the form is going to look like so I cannot really say how much of data I want to collect off of that form. Uh, whereas a, a, a UI prototype or a user interface prototype can quickly be developed, the form can be shown to the user and the user can make some adjustments based on that. Um, they can also realize whether they are going down the wrong path and completely change the requirements. So very early on prototypes can be very, very useful in trying to ensure that the system requirements are done correctly. Uh, certainly it is also useful in the design process because there could be a proof of concept you are trying to validate. For example, you are trying to uh, trying to use triple desk security in a situation uh, which may or may not require that. Um, also triple desk security may require a lot of processing power. The system is supposed to run on a, a CPU of 1.8 gigahertz only because that is the requirement from the user. So here is a design decision that you have to make. Which security protocol are you going to end up using? Are you going to use uh, triple desk security? Are you going to use RSA, etc., etc.? And this can maybe only be validated with the help of a prototype. So you actually put that in there. You do a quick performance study to see whether RSA processing is uh, going to take too much time or not. If not, you plug in a different security algorithm into that uh, situation and pick the right one that will fit your needs. So that's a, a example of using prototyping in the design process. Um, and certainly in the testing process as well to run back to back tests. So you can essentially validate uh, some ideas through the prototype. You can also run the same tests on the real system and then do a comparison to see how these two behave. And if the prototype is doing something that is accurate according to the user and the real system is failing those tests, then there must be some problem. So the benefits of prototyping then are uh, improved system usability because of the feedback that is gotten from the user very early on. Uh, also the requirements are going to be much clearer as a result of which uh, the output or the end product of this entire process matches the user's needs very well. Uh, 
um, the design quality is highly improved because you have actually had the time to take a look at several choices not just take a look at them on paper but try out the several choices and then pick the one that is right for you. Um, also the maintainability is good because this is not code that is reused all the testing that you kind of did during the design uh, phase of the software engineering life cycle right. So you wanted to plug in different algorithms and see which one is the best one um, and uh, you, you might incrementally change some of that. Now uh, all of this can be thrown away because the prototype can be thrown away and when you start development for the real system you know exactly what is to be done so the code is much better written and therefore much more maintainable. Um, and overall in fact it can reduce in uh, it, it can actually reduce the development effort of the development work that is to be done. It may even result in the system being delivered faster because the actual coding life cycle and the testing part of the life cycle which is very very important which can take very long can get reduced because the quality of the code is much better. And so th those are some of the benefits of prototyping. Uh, the process of prototyping um, is, is fairly straightforward. So you basically establish the objectives of the prototype as is shown here in the diagram um, and you uh, come up with a prototyping plan because of that. Uh, then you define the functionality of the prototype. It is kind of like developing a small module of software very, very similar to that um, and, and then you develop the prototype, evaluate the prototype and so on. Right. Um, eventually a prototype may in fact result in a better specification of the system as we shall see it may not result in any kind of code that can be reused at all. Uh, prototypes are typically throw away in nature uh, because of the fact that you may put some things into a prototype to test functionality uh, but that may not necessarily meet the non-functional needs of the system. A performance is a very, very good example which is most commonly encountered here. So the algorithm for example that you pick up maybe something that, that meets the functional needs of the specification, the functional needs of the user, but it may be impossible to meet some of the <coughs> performance needs of the user, which is a non-functional need, which is equally important at the end of the day. So the prototype will validate say the functional need and say, okay, you can certainly design the system uh, using uh, this idea, this design pattern uh, and so on but it, it has to be developed from scratch now using different algorithms to enhance performance uh, and so on. So uh, th that is one thing. Uh, prototypes typically are very rarely documented so you do not want to keep it around. It is done basically from a designer perspective. It is done from the perspective of the person who is designing the system initially and so they do not focus on documentation. If that gets kept around then you will be left with no documentation on the design of the system at the end of the day and that can prove very hard in maintenance, right. The prototype structure usually gets very rapidly degraded because of the amount of changes that is being made to the prototype. Uh, you are you're touching the code very often and you are making small or large changes, typically small changes very often because you are trying to tune the system at that point in time. Uh, you are trying to tune, tune your design, you are trying to find out which are the best ideas that are going to work uh, within the context of these requirements. Uh, so the structure is usually quite degraded after a period of time and maintainability drops as we have already seen in certain earlier lectures. And um, it will most often not meet the quality standards of the organization so that there will be some coding standard for example that most software organizations end up tending to follow um, uh, both with respect to documentation as well as with respect to code. And uh, most prototypes do not meet that because that is not what they are meant to do. They are not meant to be real code in the first place. Uh, they are meant to test out certain ideas. So these are what are called throwaway prototypes. Um, more often than not prototypes should be thrown away. It is only in very, very rare situations that they, they are retained and extended and augmented, enhanced, etc. to also meet the other requirements of the system. Um, so the, the main difference then between incremental development and prototyping is that both start with requirements right and or specifications and the increment is basically resulting in a delivered system as we see here. Um, so it is an increment is something that is actually used by the user eventually. It is put into production, it is actually used and then the user gives feedback on that. So it is not a toy system, it is not a test system in other words. Whereas if you go down the prototyping path that is if you come down this path then the prototype is constructed, it is not the increment that is constructed and the prototype essentially leads to a system specification. 
it could lead to a system design which is also a, a design specification of sorts. Uh, but essentially it leads to a better way of doing this. The best way of doing this is usually found out. So the best set of requirements for the system is found out, the best specification for the system, the best design for the system, etc. Those alternatives can be evaluated using prototypes. So the conflicting objectives then uh, of these two different ways of, of uh, handling agile development is that the objective of incremental development is always to deliver a working system to the user as quickly as possible but having very small amount of functionality. Um, so the, the, you usually start with requirements which are the best understood requirements which are unambiguous, which are clear and so on. Whereas the objective of the throwaway prototype in fact is to, uh, to, to solidify those requirements that are very ambiguous. So you, should, you typically start with the requirements which are very ambiguous, which are not well understood and try to prototype those ideas then show it to the customer. The customer never ends up using the system in any way, they only end up using it as in a test mode uh, just to see whether uh, what they have asked to be constructed is indeed what they want. Um, so the prototyping st process always starts with requirements that are very, very uh, poorly understood and this leads to a process of refining these requirements so that they are understood much better by the system designers going forward, right. So agile methods um, are typically as we have seen best suited to uh, small business, small business size systems, small businesses rapidly changing environments in which it is not very clear. So for example, you, you do not tend to use agile methods in the development of software that runs the space shuttle. That is it is not something that is done that way, their formal methods would need to be used, the specifications would have to be understood perfectly before you can construct any piece of software and it is not likely that you are going to use the software in an incremental mode on the space shuttle, only when everything is perfect will the shuttle be launched. Um, so in those kinds of systems you, you do not use agile, agile development. Systems on the other hand that are very commonly uh, employ these kind of methods are e-commerce systems um, in which uh, features can be added on an incremental basis. So the basic e-commerce site has got to be up and running for a business to be functional very, very quickly. So they need to be able to place an order, they need to be able to validate a credit card and they need to be able to uh, just take and process the order in the back end. So the placement of the order, the validation of the payment method may be something that is put out there very quickly, put out there first so that the business can get up and running. And the processing the order for example may not be automated for a long time, in fact may be completely manual behind the scenes up until the point that the next increment delivers the order processing uh, part of the system and so on. Um, so uh, typically the need for this is felt by companies where there is a dissatisfaction at the high level of overhead that is introduced by the software development process. People need the software very quickly and the focus here is more on code rather than the design. The design may not even live very long because of what is called refactoring and refactoring is a way of changing the design of changing the code to best meet uh, today's requirements, re meet the requirements of now and not what the requirements are likely to be in the future. Whereas the objective of a good design is always to meet, uh, it is future proof, right? It is to future proof the system to make sure that any new requirements that may come in down the line can also be accommodated in the system pretty easily. Um, Agile methods are again in summary are based uh, very much on iterative uh, methods to software development and intended to deliver working software very, very quickly. So what is the process? Well, for, for example, what are some of the principles behind uh, agile methods or rapid application development? The first principle clearly uh, is that of customer involvement. We have seen that, that the user is continually involved. Uh, the user has to be involved in specifying the system and quickly evaluating the increment that is coming out or the prototype that is coming out giving feedback and so on. Um, and uh, so incremental delivery obviously is another principle of uh, this process. And this is a process that very much depends, the, the methods here, the methodology very much depends on the skill level of the people rather than um, on the process itself. Uh, so it is not process based, it depends on uh, how good the people are at working uh, very rapidly to turn around software without appropriate designs, without formal specifications and so on. Uh, 
So, these would have to be people who can understand the customer's needs by looking at uh, initial set of requirements, quickly working with the customer to deliver some software. And the system is inherently designed for change. So, for, for, for example, what does that mean when it comes down to reality is that everything that can be made configurable has to be made configurable. Um, a, a good example of this might be that uh, the system can work with any database. Today, we are working with uh, a free uh, database that is available in free software and uh, this may be MySQL for example or Postgres SQL. Uh, whereas uh, once the uh, system reaches a certain level of maturity, we might have to switch over to Oracle, we might have to switch over to Sybase or some other kind of relational database that is commercially uh, accepted. So, in such a case what we want to do is completely isolate the dependence of the system on the database itself by introducing some kind of a standard layer such as ODBC, JDBC or so on. Uh, and then the, the, the exact database that you end up using is typically simply a configuration parameter that is placed in some kind of a configuration file. And on changing that configuration parameter the system picks up the right driver to the database, runs with it and is able to function on any database platform. So, the system is designed for change essentially there is not a lot of coupling uh, between different modules of the system that the, the, this is something that is a, a standard software engineering metric that you want to reduce the, the coupling between modules and you want to increase the cohesion within a module and but that has to be followed in the extreme when it comes down to agile methods because of the amount of change that is going on all the time within the software. So, the problems with agile methods are that it can be difficult to keep the interest of the customers alive because they have to do so much more work in the development of the software here. Although they are not exactly sitting down and coding or designing, they have to be constantly involved uh, and to keep that involvement at, at, a, at a high level all the time may be very, very difficult. Um, it may be hard to assemble and maintain a team uh, which gets used to the very intense kind of environment that characterizes these methods because the software turnaround time could be as small as 2 to 3 weeks uh, and for a piece of software to get developed in 2 to 3 weeks implies that there is going to be some fairly intense activity in those 2 to 3 week period. Um, so, not all people are capable of working at that pace and you have to pick the people uh, who are right for that kind of environment, who, who thrive on that kind of environment. Um, also prioritizing changes can become very difficult. Right. So, which are the requirements that need to, to go out first? The customer typically has a tendency to start saying I want all of them because all of them are important to me uh, and it is very hard for him to prioritize uh, the set of changes that are going to go into the next increment. Also there can be multiple stakeholders using the system. So, if a system is used by accounting, by finance, it is used by operation, it is used by legal uh, and so on, each person will have a different perspective of what is important for them. And to, to put out an increment which, which serves one group of stakeholders but not another is going to end up alienating the rest of the stakeholders in the process and that could become a real problem. And as we have already seen earlier contracts and the process of writing contracts uh, could be very, very hard in this process. So, having seen uh, the general principles uh, involved in agile software development, let us take a look at a very specific uh, process that has become very, very popular over the uh, past 5 years or so, it is called extreme programming. Um, extreme programming is probably the best known, the most widely used agile method today, uh, especially in open source development where there are a lot of people that, that are used, but certainly in a lot of companies as well. Um, and there are various flavors of extreme programming. It is not a practice that you know lays down like ISO 9001 process that you know this, this, this and have to be done. Uh, it is a set of principles, the guiding principles that have been put together to say do try to do software development this way uh, and here is a way by which you can do rapid application development um, uh, which can possibly work for you. Um, as the name kind of implies, it takes a very extreme view or an approach towards iterative development. Uh, for example, uh, there can be several builds happening per day. By build I mean that you are compiling all your code, integrating everything and running the tests. Um, increments are delivered to the customers every 2 weeks. Uh, that is pretty much fixed and uh, that is it is a very, uh, very short cycle time to be delivering software. Uh, if you worked on software projects, you will understand what I mean. Um, and every test must run for every build and the test typically have to be written even before the code is written uh, that the tests are going to test. So, uh, it is it's a, it's a strange 
initially it sounds a little strange it is a it is an extreme form of agile development like I said. Let us take a look at what some of the elements of extreme programming are over the period of the uh, last several years Kent Beck was one of the founders of extreme programming. Uh, there have been several books written on this and this whole thing is solidified into a fairly well understood process today. Uh, <clears throat> the four core values as, as we call them of extreme programming are the first thing is the ability to communicate. Um, so, the communication has to be very, very strong and tight in the team. Uh, the second thing is simplicity, the third is feedback and the fourth is courage and all these things have to come together uh, in order for an XP project to be successful. Uh, although each one of these sounds a little vague, there is actually a very definite process behind each one of these and how we can achieve good communication and so on. Uh, so, let us first look at communication which is the first XP value. Uh, communication uh, is basically enforced through a series of practices that XP has woven into its process uh, which cannot be carried out without communicative. Um, and one of the examples of this is pair programming. Pair programming is the notion that two developers sit down together to write the same piece of code. In fact, they are doing it at a single workstation. So, they are not working independently and then comparing. As one developer is working and writing the code, the other developer kind of watches over his shoulders, kind of, uh, helps him avoid the mistakes that he would otherwise end up making, which is going to be caught later in the cycle. So, instead of catching mistakes later, so for example, you write bad code and it is going to fail a test later, uh, if, if, the, if your other pair developer is going to catch that error right as you are coding it, then you can save a lot of time and effort. Uh, so, that is one example of, uh, of uh, communication. The other practice is that of frequent integration because of the fact that your code is integrating with somebody else's change uh, maybe several times a day. Uh, you are kind of forced to make sure that you stay in touch with everybody <clears throat> and explain where things went wrong, how you can fix them, how quickly you can fix them and so on. Uh, in fact, uh, XP or extreme programming XP as it is called for short also advocates the job of a coach. Uh, a role that is taken on by one of the team members whose who's, uh, uh, only jobs to make sure that people are talking to each other all the time and if he sees that uh, this is not happening, he may end up reintroducing these people. Uh, and fixing these problems. So, that is a very important role in the XP world. So, the second core principle or value of XP was that of simplicity and there are two ways of going about uh, building software, actually building anything, but building software as well. Uh, one way is to kind of design for the future, right. So, you put in certain features that you think that um, somebody might want to ask you down the road, you know, why build it later if you can build it into the software right now when I am building the module. That is one philosophy. The other philosophy is to keep things really simple up until the point that you need the feature and then you build it in. So, you are not afraid of changing the code, you are not afraid of adding to the code, but you can, you can do that at the point in time that it is required. So, why complicate the system with features that are never going to be used? Uh, up until some later point in time if you can build a simpler system. So, simplicity and communication obviously support each other. So, you should only build minimalist systems, minimalist modules, minimalist units which are put together and these can be changed uh, as the software development process goes along. The third uh, value is that of feedback um, uh, and feedback in XP works at, uh, at various levels. Uh, one is certainly the user feedback because of the increments that are being delivered to the user uh, uh, through different uh, uh, story collections uh, that happen from the user that is the requirements are being changed. They are called stories within XP um, and it also happens amongst the different developers themselves. So, when pair programming is taking place, one developer is giving the other one feedback. There are frequent reviews happening within this process. Uh, uh, where one programmer presents the idea of what is it that they have done and the other designers or the programmers in the team sit down and give them feedback on what could have been done better, what are the things that are working really well and so on. Um, <clears throat> so, the, the emphasis is on various values that encourage a very, very tight uh, feedback cycle within the process. And the fourth value is that of courage and uh, by courage I mean that XP might, in, might ask you to refactor which means you could end up throwing your old code away uh, much like the prototyping case. Although people are typically very, very hesitant to throw away work that they have already done, even understanding that the work is not good and it could be harmful in the future. 
um, and here you should absolutely fight against that tendency uh, because of the fact that you may only have written a very very small part of the system it, it may not be large enough for you to uh, for you to want to keep all the time so you, you can actually throw it away and develop this whole thing anew and that's something that xp encourages quite a bit so what does the release cycle for extreme programming look like um, there are remember the subset of requirements that go into an increment this, this is nothing but an agile development process right the subset of requirements is called a story a story concentrates on a very small uh, requirement or a subset of requirements that are all related to each other and we'll go through an example story uh, as part of this lesson uh, so you break that story you take that particular story that is going to be part of this increment and only typically only one story is part of the increment uh, you break it down into a set of tasks um, as this diagram shows you right and then you plan the release based on the set of tasks that have to be done at this point in time you kind of know what the effort level required of that increment is going to be does it fit into the two week cycle is the question you have to ask yourself if it does not then it is the wrong story that you have picked and you might have to go back and change it uh, so you develop, uh, you develop the software you integrate and you test the software release the software this is a formal release um, unlike something that is uh, that's, uh, done in prototyping. So this is something that is delivered to the customers accepted by the customer and you then move on right and then you end up evaluating the system you select the stories for the next release. So this very much looks like the process that we saw earlier of iterative uh, development very very similar in fact this is nothing but a process of iterative development uh, specifically applied to this uh, scenario. So what are some of the XP practices it is something that we would like to go through next. Um, incremental planning as we have seen before what characterizes agile development incremental planning is something that is um, absolutely uh, followed very rigorously here uh, small releases a two week cycle is pretty much mandated in extreme programming so you have to release some piece of functionality in two every two weeks and uh, that is the idea here uh, simple design uh, actively avoiding complexity so you have to make an active effort to just put in uh, the set of features that are uh, minimally required of that iteration and not of something that is going to appear three iterations later you feel that it is going to appear three iterations later there is always a tendency of people to want to make things robust to want to make things um, larger than what it should be for the current moment and may even end up jeopardizing by making the user paying for a feature that he never uses. Uh, because it might affect performance it could affect availability and so on. Um, the other important uh, XP practice is what is called test first development and uh, there you develop the tests a unit test even before you write the code and we will see what this is refactoring is the next one refactoring is the ability not necessarily to just rewrite the code but refactoring is the ability to maybe change your design by without changing the behavior so for example the way different modules are interconnected with each other uh, could be one, one such example. Um, so you may end up changing the design without actually having to rewrite a large amount of code and that is what refactoring is. Pair programming something we have already talked about where two or more typically two people sit down and write a part of code together. Uh, collective ownership where it often what happens in software development processes is that uh, a group of developers get wedded to one or two more some x modules of the system and they know those modules very well but they do not understand the rest of the system at all and, and that proves very fatal because if, if, if those group of programmers leave or for some reason they have to be moved out of the project then there is nobody else who understands that part of the system very well. <clears throat> so what XP does is try to introduce a practice where people move around different modules they are not wedded to one module of the system as a result of which they typically end, tend to get a good idea of all parts of the system and there are no islands of knowledge are going to end up developing. Uh, the next practice is continuous integration, continuous integration is one where multiple people's uh, changes code changes are brought together frequently so typically twice a day is how, how you end up tending to integrate. Um, and for every integration what is more important is to make sure that you test the integration it is not just that you throw the code together uh, and then you move on um, you have to make sure that it all compiles together 
So you might have interfaces that are being used by other people and it may not compile because you made a change in the interface that is being used by somebody else. Uh, it also has to pass all the tests, it, it not just has to compile but remember since the tests have been written even before the code has been written it has to pass all the tests. Uh, you have to make sure that you keep a sustainable pace of development, it is not something that uh, XP in fact actively discourages people from working very, very long hours, uh, the, the standard notion of overtime does not exist in this kind of a model. Um, and uh, so you have to keep a sustainable pace of development, not something that, that goes very high for a period of time and then drops drastically uh, after that. Uh, it also demands an on-site customer involvement, so there needs to be somebody who pretty much stays with the development team on a continual basis. It is not something that can be thrown over to the ward of the customer say you take a look at it and come back. So the customer is often uh, involved in development as well to some extent. So, the agile principles are pretty obvious, right? XP is, is, is clearly a way of doing agile uh, development as well. And uh, we, we have seen that the focus is on people here and not processes. Uh, change is supported because of the regular system releases that are already built in um, and so on. And customer involvement is pretty continual. So requirement scenarios in, in XP are basically called stories and let us take a, a brief look at how uh, XP functions internally um, and these stories are basically written on cards and uh, the development team breaks each story that they pick for that increment down into a set of implementation tasks, right. There may not be an overall design, uh, so certainly there may be some uh, architecture that the team adheres to. So for example, this is a service oriented architecture that we are going to use. Uh, this is a pipes and filter architecture that we are going to use and that decision may be made very early in the life cycle of the entire software project or maybe even before the first increment is done. But going beyond there, there, there is no uh, emphasis on designing individual modules by themselves, right. Uh, so the tasks are basically implementation tasks and these are the basis of uh, creating the schedule and the cost estimates. So only after you have broken them down into tasks and you understand how many tasks there are and what is the complexity of each task and since you are doing it on a very small scale, you can then say this iteration is going to cost X. There is no cost for the entire project, it is very hard to determine that because you have not planned out all the iterations ahead of time and these are done as you go along. So the customer is the one that ends up choosing the stories for inclusion in a particular increment, right and uh, that will then drive the cost of that increment and so on. So here is an example of a story card that uh, we have written out. The story card is uh, with reference to the library system that we have talked about in uh, earlier lectures in this course. Um, and uh, here is the story card for downloading a document. So the assumption is that people can download documents and print them for a certain fee. So uh, the story goes thus. So first you select the article you want from the list and once you have selected the article, uh, you tell the system how you intend to pay for it. Then you get a copyright from the system, copyright form from the system that you have to sign and submit back to the system. You can fill this online and once you have submitted it, the system downloads the document onto your computer. It asks you to select a printer onto which this document is going to be printed, prints the document and then deletes the document from your computer because you are not allowed to use it any further. That one printed copy that you have is pretty much all you are entitled to of that payment because of the copyright. Uh, restrictions on the document. So this is the story card, this is the story, it kind of details an entire user scenario if you will. Uh, so if you take a, if, if you take an analogy to UML use cases, this may be one use case in the system or it may be one or two use cases which are related to each other. <coughs> So the design guidelines then uh, for XP is that simplicity obviously is very key and is at the heart of the entire design process. So you choose some kind of a system metaphor, uh, you can uh, write out CRC cards uh, as in the object oriented design process, you must have heard of uh, the uh, CRC card notion. Uh, then you create a spike solution, never add functionality too early in the process, right. And uh, you, you can always start off with very, very small stuff but then you refactor uh, as much as you want to add things as you go along as opposed to committing very early on in the process to requirements that may not be uh, needed. So 
um, in terms of uh, change it uh, basically XP takes the opposite view of the conventional wisdom of change um, in that uh, it basically anticipates that change is going to happen all the time um, and uh, the conventional view is that it is worth anticipating changes and therefore let us build it into the software ahead of time and therefore we are future proof proofing the software. XP however is completely opposite it says we will only build what is required now and as we go along if changes need to take place we will do them and there is there is no problem for this right. Uh, testing uh, you always do test first so you have to write the unit test first the integration test and all of that tests have to be built out for the scenario or the user story that has been selected for that increment. So only after you have written the unit test you go ahead and code the module. So the user the automated test harnesses have to be set up very early on in the life cycle. Um, so this can be done using uh, several methods and tools that are available out there. Um, and every time something is released it is completely tested. So every integration is unit tested, is integration tested um, before we move on to the next iteration. So the task cards, these are the example for the task cards. So there, be, there can be three different tasks for that story that we just laid out. The story was that of uh, uh, the document downloading. Uh, the task, the three tasks here were that you implement the principal workflow. The workflow is that you will select the uh, document, you would select the payment method, you would fill in the payment details, it would validate the payment details, it would give you a copyright form, fill, etc., etc. So that is the workflow. Um, then you implement the article uh, catalog and the selection. So this may be a drop down menu, this may be a set of articles that come onto your HTML screen, etc., etc. The third thing is you implement payment collection. Payment collection may be collecting a credit card information, validating the credit card information uh, with the credit card provider and so on and so forth, <coughs> right. Uh, so the, the, that particular story was broken down into three different tasks and when you have tasks at this granularity, it is easy to determine uh, what the cost of this is going to be. Here is an example of uh, test case descriptions. So you are testing credit card validity in this case. So the input to this test process is uh, two sets of strings, one string is the credit card number, the second string is two integers uh, which will represent month and year of expiry, right. Um, I mean the, the second uh, input is two integers that will represent the month and year of uh, expiry. Uh, then you have to run all the tests, you have to make certain validations before you go and check whether the credit card itself is valid by submitting it to the issuer of the card and the output of this test is OK or error message, right. It is an example of a test that is written out even before development starts. That is what is key. That is what test first development um, is all about. Uh, pair programming we have also discussed um, and this is something where programmers work in pairs sitting down together to develop code. Um, it also helps develop common ownership of the code as well as encourages the communication value that we talked about earlier. It also serves as an inbuilt review process. So you are constantly refactoring right then and there uh, because there is somebody giving you feedback at the moment that you are writing the code and not something that happens uh, far later. So in summary uh, XP is a new approach, it is very deliberate, disciplined, designed um, and uh, it is somewhat controversial because not everybody accepts it uh, because some of the changes to the way of thinking that have to be done um, and it does adapt several of the best ideas. Uh, from past decades of software development that have taken place. Uh, it has become very, very successful because it stresses customer satisfaction because of the fact that the customer is involved all the time right from the first two week increment that is delivered. Um, the customer uh, is in the loop and he is giving you continual feedback on what they like about it and what they do not like about the way the development is progressing um, and it emphasizes teamwork in the development process. Uh, so this is a summary of extreme programming which is an agile uh, development process um, and there are some other processes as well but XP is one of the most popular uh, ones to watch out for.